Okay, if you have your Bibles, open them to 1 John, uh, really chapter 2, chapter 3 this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. I thank you for what you are doing in our world. Lord, I thank you for the other missions and ministries that are carrying forth your word in the world. Thank you for Leroy and the work that he's doing. Thank you for Paul and Jarvis for their work. Now I pray now, Lord, that you would open our understanding, open our mind as we study your word this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Let's go back and do a, just a little bit of review from yesterday in this book here that we are dealing with here. The, the, the Gospel of John, I mean the um, Epistles of John is like a companion uh, letters uh, from the Gospel. It's really about the incarnation of God in human form. And it's about then God really incarnating himself in us through the new birth. And that we, the church, be in the continuation of, the, of Christ here on earth. And that we are living out and carrying on the work that he came to do 2,000 years ago. And that's the whole idea of the new birth. The new birth here is that Jesus was the eternal son of God. He was a part of the eternal family of God. And that that God has revealed himself. And yesterday we said, John made it clear. We've touched him. We've seen him. He was here. That he was God. Now, what he's saying then, when we then come to know this God as Savior, he gives us the power to become a part of the family of God, a fact that we are born into the family of God. That was the big dialogue that Jesus had with Nicodemus, which was an absolutely important idea, a conversation. And the idea of that conversation, it came out of God's deep love for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He talks about his son now coming into the world in order to do away with sin. That's what the incarnation is about. This is about the extreme of God incarnating himself as Jesus of Nazareth so that he could die on the cross for our sin. And sin is the big problem. Sin is the human dilemma. And that Jesus came into this world to be a human being, that he would be the second Adam, that so that he could then die for sin, so he could take, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, God had a major problem. Because God had created us to have intimate fellowship with this humanity. And that was his purpose. Almost God's purpose is almost defeated. Because God, since he's eternal, since he's unchangeable, that he can't look at sin. And so God had a problem. And that problem is this now. How can he get rid of sin and have fellowship with you and me? How could God still be just and justify you and me is the big biblical question. And so to a certain degree, as we play with justice all the time, justice was God's deep motivation for redemption. It was how could God be true and just and then have this fellowship with you and me? And so God himself then had to take on a body and to come to this world. And God now have got to grow up and he got to defeat sin. And he got to defeat sin based upon his word. And so when, even when he was in the world, when all the temptation came to him and all the temptation that comes to humanity came to Jesus in that great temptation. The lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Satan hit him with everything that he had. And Jesus used the word of God to overcome all of those temptations. And so, because he was the word of God, and he lived it out. And then the big deal then, he went to the cross. The angels that said at his birth, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. And there on that cross, God took care of sin. He died on that cross, the just for the unjust. And yesterday we were talking about the fact, and that he then created this, eternal fountain of blood and this eternal fountain of blood is there he took away our sin and he's that blood is there when we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior Christ takes away and takes care of the sin of Adam the original sin he takes care of that sin then we are born to his family and we are now both human but we also have the Spirit of God living in us as his people. And that blood now is available for our daily sin to keep us in relationship. If we knew the extreme that God has went to, if we truly understood salvation, we could live this eternal life much better. The whole idea, as I said yesterday morning, that salvation means that he saves us from the past. That's the Adam, he saved them from Egypt. The past, he broke the bondage there. He took them into the wilderness and he saved them in the wilderness. And then through Joshua, he took them into the land. You and I have been saved from our past sin. We are being saved now by our sin, but that sin today that we are being saved for is that fountain of blood that is there. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me whiter than snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In order to live out this eternal life, we got to be able to live this life of confession all the time. Live it out. And the way we get rid of sin is by confessing it. There's no other way. And to get God forgiven. We can't fix it out. Sometimes sin is like scrambled eggs. You can't put it back together. It gets worse as we mess with it. The solution to sin is to confess that sin. That's why they put Jesus to death. They put Jesus to death because he said to this person that is it easier to say to this person, uh, take up your bed and walk, or to say to him, your sins are forgiven. The most powerful act of God in the world is when God forgives our sin. If you're talking about the miracle of miracles, it's when God forgives us our sin. The, sin the, the other miracle that would be a little bit almost equal, comparative to the great miracle would be when he raised people from the dead. Because that's exactly what happens when you come into the kingdom of God. What happens when you come into the family of God? God, sin has destroyed you. And that you are dead in your trespasses and your sin. But when you come to know and fall in love with this wonderful Savior and discover that his deep love for you and that he forgive you of your sin, he said, that is the greatest miracle of all. When people come into the kingdom of God, oh, of course, if I would put a towel around my head and some kind of robe on and would come out here every day and have somebody come up in this stage and I put my hand on them and do a little boogie boogie and they get, they get healed. I mean, y'all would flock in here from the thousand. You would come from all over the world to see me do my voodoo. But the greatest miracle, the greatest miracle of all, it was almost yesterday morning it was almost yesterday morning when people became conscious of the fact that there is sin in our lives. And we came here and kneeled at that altar. And I know among all of those people, some of them were saying, God, restore me. Forgive me of my sin. Restore me back into this relationship to you. That is the miracle of miracles. This is the sign and wonder that Jesus said would follow the church. 
this sign and wonders that God would be forever bringing people into the kingdom of God, bringing them from death to life. And he would be forever then restoring that eternal relationship with us as we confess our sin. He is faithful. He is just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's just sort of the introduction for what I'm going to teach here this morning. But I think that you needed this introduction. And we see, it's how do we live? How do we live in this crooked and perverse world? The world is against us. The world lies in the hands of the evil one, and he has made us salt and light in this world. And so we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we are wrestling against principalities and powers as we live out this eternal life. Now, we should be courageous. We should be courageous because death has been taken care of. We should be absent from this body present with the Lord. Paul lived in that, that pressure all the time. He lived with the joy of going home to be with God, but he lived with the needs of the people around him. And so he was all, he was, it would be better for me to go home to be with the Lord. I would enjoy better. But for your sake, it's better for me to be here and be the teacher and helping you to live this Christian life. And we have made this Christian life too sloppy. And we have did that and we have taken it for some kind of superficial joy and think all the church's job is, is to make us superficially happy. And the church becomes the entertainment center. Instead, the church becoming a teaching center. The whole idea of our gathering together is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And then we should worship God out of the fact he's done so much for us. We understand his deep love. This is our teaching. Let's look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. I'm going to go to chapter 3 and I'm going to back up to, to do our teaching this morning in chapter 3. This is a passage here. And it just sort of thrills me when I read it. It says, Think how much, verse 1, chapter 3. Think how much the Father loves us. He loves us so much that he let us be called his children, as we truly are. But since the world, since the world's people do not know Christ, they don't know us either. Now, what he's fixing to do here in this passage, he is making this church family, the church family, he's fixing to create a universal family. He's fixing to create a universal family that goes across racial, culture, and economic barriers. And sin is going to affect us in the family just like it affects anything else. And so he's creating a family. You see, there is no basis in Scripture for the people of God to live racial and hold hatred and animosity against another believer. The whole idea of this reconciliation at the cross was to make us a new family a family of God. He's now thinking to create a universal family. And we got to now live like that universal family. And, and, and if you overplay, and this is saying, if you overplay the family in terms of the individual family, you're going to end up with apartheid, racism, bigotry, and genocide. The whole idea here is that God is making a universal family that can live together in love. And he's going to make love because his love provided all of this for us. He's going to make love as a sign that the world can see as they look at these people that he's making. I'm just trying to explain to you 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we once knew Jesus as a racial guy, as a Jew. 
But now that we're in Christ, we know him no more. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, they are a new creature. They've been born again. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. We are now in the family of God, and we judge no one anymore by our race and ethnicity. We judge them now because we are now in this new universal family of God. And now the world is going to know we are Christian because we are living that kind of relationship with each other. These other people are killing each other, doing genocide. These other folks are hating each other. The other folks are conquering each other. The strong is destroying the weak, and we are colonizing them and controlling them. But we are the liberators. We bring them good news. We bring them good news that God has incarnated himself in human affairs, and that he lives his life out through his local church and through his people, and that these people belong to, that's the idea. I know we have reduced Christianity down to racism and bigotry. We can have a, an apartheid church, and we can defend that any way we want to defend it. We can call it homogeneous, family friendly, and all of that stuff. All of that is another form, another form of not un understanding that we've been born. Listen to what he says. How great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we can be called the children of God. That we can be called the sons and daughters of God. That, that just, John can't find red words to express what has happened to us. Now, how do we keep that relationship? That's what this epistle is about. This epistle is about how we keep that relationship. And the secret to this epistle here is the confession of our sin. Confessing of our sin and then to live in this out in the world. In chapter 2, if we go back now, that was a verse I wanted you to know. The extreme of this love. The extreme of this love that God has shown towards us. Now we go back to chapter uh, 2 here and pick up our... Uh, have a lesson here. You go back to verse 7. Let's read this here in verse 7. My dear friend, I'm not writing to give you a new commandment. Now, he's freaking to give us this whole idea of how we're to live. We are to live out a life of love. We are to live out a life of love. And we're to live out this life of love in the family. Now, you know, sometimes we're talking about the, the idea that you can you strive to love the world. You strive to tell them how much God loved them. But the thought is that you can never love the world as much as you're supposed to love your sisters and brothers that are already in the family of God. As much as lie in us, we try to love the world. But we, in the family of God, Demonstrate that love by the way we walk. And people, if we see our brothers and sisters destitute of daily food, this is in the family of God. Now, this is in the family of God. And you don't give them those things that are needed for the body. It says, how dwell the love of God in you. And so in the church, in the family of God, the people had no needs. There were people out there, laws will always have needs. And it's our responsibility, our joy. He has equipped us to go out there and to embrace those people, to show them that love, not only in words, but in deeds and in truth. We're trying to show the world how much we love each other. But he's taking it, this should be natural within the family of God. This should be natural within the family. Look at what, let's watch this here. Let's go read it. Read it. This ain't just coming out of my head uh, here. He said, dear friend, I'm not writing to you to give a new commandment. I, he's talking about love. He wants us to say that love has always been God's way of demonstrating his love. The redemption of the nation of Israel was to be an eternal model to show God's love for that nation, to make it an incubator so which he himself could be incarnated into the world. And so that was to be a model. And he demonstrates that love for them time and time in the wilderness. 
as they ought to have been destroyed. But he demonstrates this love, this love. And so we, the church, becomes his replacement. And he have demonstrated his love by his death on the cross. Now he's demonstrating his love as we live for him. Look, let's go to the family. So this is John talking to a family. The family is the, the church is modeled after the family. This was probably one of the house churches that he had started. And these churches were meeting in the home. And if you read all three of these epistles here, you will see it that way. It has to do with personal thing, personal idea in, in, in there. This is not the, the, the big uh, things about uh, theology. This is the more or less about how families deal with each other. And so he's telling them here about the new commandment. He wants them to know that this is the one that Christ told them. You can, and he says here, now, he's talking to us now who are the Christians. It is the same one that you were first given, and it is the message you've heard. That's love. But it really is a new commandment. In the sense now, you can do it. You can do it. Now, how you can do it? You can do it now because you have the power of the Holy Spirit and you have the forgiveness of sin. You have that fountain. You have that fountain filled with blood. And whenever some problem comes, you come to each other and you confess that. And God is faithful and he's just to forgive us for our sin. Now, this is in the family. This is in the family of God. And look what he says here. God will, will, uh, will uh, take it. He says here now, this new commandment, you can know its true meaning just as Christ does. You can see the darkness fading away and the true light is already shining. Look what he says now. If we claim to be in the light and hate someone, you are still in the darkness. You get the idea? Hate is just the other side of love. And our whole idea of the church here, we've been redeemed by God's love. It's this great love. And our trademark to the world is the way we love each other within the body. And then how do we reach out to this humanity out there who God's love and he saved us to be his missionaries. He saved us so that we could reach out to the world as he reached out to the world. We are his ambassadors. He has no other hands down here on earth but your hand and my hand. And we have to be reaching out to the lost. The idea here is that he's taking it for granted that we're supposed to be caring for each other within the body. There ought to be no needs among us. We ought to be able now to, and that's what gets me about all this prosperity theology. It is too me focus. It is too me focus. It is to what God is going to do. God has done what is necessary and provided what is necessary for me. By his death on the cross, he has provided, and he has now for me the forgiveness of sin that I can have. Now I can walk in the light of God and his Holy Spirit power as he guides me and leads me to do his work on earth. He equipped us to be his workers here on earth. That was the idea of redemption. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of our own works, lest anyone should boast. But then he says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. And this good works here is reaching out to the world. This good work here is letting our light so shine before the world that they might see our good works and glorify the Father which name. The world is in darkness. And God want us to shine his lights in the midst of this crooked. And you see this in the Bible here. Let's go here, back what he says here. He said here, if we claim, if we claim to be in the light and hate someone, we are still in the darkness. Still in the dark. But if we love others, we are in the light. You get that? This is pretty simple. If we love others, we are in the light. 
and we don't cause problem for them. Isn't that something? We don't cause problem for them. But if we hate someone, if we hate others, we are living and walking in the dark. We don't know where we are going because the darkness has blind eyes. Now he gets into talking to us in the family. And I'm going to run through this. This is important. This is very important because it's in the family. And as I read this here, you know, my greatest struggle as a, as a pastor has not really been the world out there. My greatest struggle, my personal struggle, have been in my own personal family. My big struggles have been in the family of God. Our people not understanding. That's where my biggest struggle has been in the world. God has sort of fortified me. I think that night in the Brandon Jail, back in 1970, when I was tortured and beaten in that Brendan jail. And when those white law enforcement officers tortured me in that jail, I saw the ugliness of racism and bigotry and hatred. And it was that night I saw it. And from that night I said, I wouldn't wish this kind of bigotry upon anyone. And what I would like to do with the rest of my life, I would like to preach a gospel that can burn through white racism, black racism, Mexican racism, other racism, and bring people to God so they can live like we ought to live in this world. I know what that feels like, and I don't wish that kind of bigotry on anybody else in our world. And so let's look what he says here. He said, and now he gets into the family. He says, children, I'm writing you because your sin have been forgiven. That's the idea. Now, what he's trying to do now, he's teaching us. He's teaching us how to walk in the world. And he wants us to have a sense of gratitude. Gratitude that our sins have been forgiven. Oh, that you have passed from darkness into light. The Christian life should be a life of gratitude. That God in his love took it on, on himself to come down and to redeem us. And then provide his blood that is ever alive. That when we do sin, we have this advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he'll forgive us of our sin. And so we have this relationship. That's what he's trying to get these children here to see. Look what he says here. Your sins have been forgiven in the name of Jesus. He says to the parents, listen to what he said to the parents. Parents, I'm writing you because you have known the one who was there from the beginning. Young people, I'm writing you because you have defeated the evil one. When you come to know Jesus Christ, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But don't give all of your attention to the devil. You know, I listen to people all the time, they talk like the devil is bigger than Jesus. You know, I, I listen to it all the time. You, you, you know, we, he overcome the world. And because he overcome the world, we in him, not in our flesh, but we in him can overcome the world. We can live because he got the solution for us. That is all a part of the redemption, redemptive plan and that we can walk in this world. Look what he says here. Overcome the evil one. Children, I'm writing you because you have known the Father. Parents, I'm writing you because you have known the one who was there from the beginning. Young people, he's going over and over. That's what he's doing. He wants you to understand it. That's what he's doing. He's repeating it because it's so very important that he wants you to understand this and act upon it. Young people, I'm writing you because you are strong. God's message is firm in your heart. You know, the young folks, they're the one that's got the energy. The old folks, we're the one that should have the wisdom. And that wisdom then, that we share that wisdom and help to guide this new generation. That's what I'm so excited about. I'm so excited about it as I look out and see the age of the people. But I'm also excited as I look out and see these bald heads and these gray heads. <laughs> and I'm also, as I meet people in here, they are coming in groups. And some of the old folks are showing me the groups that they helped to get here. Some of them who paid the fare for these young folks to get here. 
They got the resources. They got the wisdom. They got the knowledge. They understand the importance of this whole movement of CCDA being a movement that's finally trying to burn through this racial and social garbage in the world and seeing that it don't have any redemptive elements in it. Hate is not good. And I'm, far, and I'm in my nation, I'm afraid now that we are forever looking for somebody to hate. It, it, it seems like to me that we are trying our best to hate the immigrants. And I, and I try to say, don't do that. Why do we want to do that? God tells us to care for the strangers, the aliens, those people. God tells us to do that. Yeah, that that's, let the world handle that. But you and I, they are people. They are human beings created in the image of God. And it's our work, it's our work to shine the light of God through their lives. I don't care what you say. That's the church's work. That's the government's government. I ain't fighting my government. I ain't fighting my government. Boy, if I was going to fight the government, I would have fought it back there when Paul said things like, slaves, obey your master. You know, you know, and so I'm not fighting my government. What I'm trying to do is to get the church together so that we can shine in this world. I mean, we, uh, boy, I, I tell you what happened. I was in Washington the other day. They all gathered me another week in Chicago, really. The, the conservative group Christian called me together. And know what they said to me? We want you to come to us and spend a day and a half with us because we have been captured by the economic conservatives. And we have equal conservatism to Christianity. You can't do that. You ought not to. They want to get out of it. Praise God for them. We spent some time with them trying to help them overcome that, trying to help them to know that conservatism and Christianity is not the same thing. Neither is liberalism and the Democratic Party is the same as Christianity. You got to understand that. You got to understand that and not cave in and not mix them and, and really not necessarily. I wasn't good. I didn't go there and bombard my conservative friend. I went there and tried to shed some light. Ron Sider was with me and other people was with me. We went in there and tried to throw some light on that. We tried to show them. We tried to say to them. I tried to say to them, you guys be Daniel. Y'all be Daniel in Babylon. Y'all be Joseph in Egypt and shine out your light in the midst of this. I didn't tell them to get out of that. I didn't tell them to leave. Maybe God has placed them there as his witness. We need to get more people. We need to get more of our people elected here. Elected. I don't care what party you get elected in. Get elected. Get elected. But then I'm expecting you, I'm expecting you to let your light shine in that dark place. I'm expecting you to be Daniel. I'm expecting you to be Joseph in prison. And let's don't come up with all this hate. Let's don't say we hate the liberal. We hate them liberals. We hate them. That, that ain't right. God don't want us hating. God wants us to be a light of love. The gospel is about the demonstration of God's love to humanity. Amen. That's why the cross is so important. The cross is so important to the Christian. Don't let people take the cross away from you. Don't let them take the cross away from you. Because the cross is a statement of the depths of God's love for humanity. That's what it's about. That's what about. And so we are representing this. And let me go on here and finish this here, if I can, this morning. Okay. And so he, he tells us here. Uh, then verse, let's go, let's go um, to verse 15. 15. Don't love the world. Don't love the world's system. Don't love the world's system. 
You know, I'm looking at this, I, this bailout. They got all of this money to those banks. And those banks are getting as much bonus as they got before with our taxpayer money. Don't you love this world system? This world system is not going to quite do what we can do as God's people. Don't depend on this world system to do what God wants to do through us as God's people. We, the church, really ought to offer somewhat of a, an alternative to the world system. We ought to be showing people that there is a better life. That's what the idea of the kingdom of God had meant. The kingdom of God, we were not to make the kingdom of God because God himself is going to come and establish the kingdom. What we're supposed to do is reflect the kingdom of God. We we'll like to live like the kingdom is coming, and the way we live show people that a bigger kingdom is coming. That's the whole idea of the kingdom. And that's what Jesus said, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom, the kingdom of God is here because he was there. And because he was reflecting God's love in the villages that he went to, he's reflecting God's love. We, the church then, is supposed to be reflecting God's love in our neighborhoods and in our community in which we, which we live. Let me continue here. He says, don't love the world. Uh, uh, if you love the world, uh, you cannot love the Father. Now, he talks about where sin comes from. Now, he's going to define sin for you here. And this is a great definition of sin, people. Look what he's going to define here. Our foolish pride comes from this world, and so does our selfish desire. Let me tell you what sin is. Sin is pride and selfish desire. Sin is when we are putting anything over against God against the will of God. And usually it comes out of our own pride. You know, every time, since I've been a minister for 50 years, every time I go to a, a church event or a dispute within an organization, you know what I lay my hands on as the first thing that is causing all of that is pride. And pride is so evasive you can't get your hands on it. The original sin was the sin of pride. And the, and the original sin is the sin of my own selfish desire. If that's a statement about Lucifer's and about the devil in the Bible, it says that he wanted to exalt himself above God. And pride is that weakness is in people. And it's in all of us. Oh, Lord, we need to pray this, get out of us. Because the Bible says God resisted the proud. He gives his grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty power of God, that he might exalt us in due time. I tell you, people, that we have got to do the best we can to walk in humility. I, sometimes I think I have so many problems because I think it's a little bit of it in me. And I think God, I, and I think tribulation sort of worked that out of you. Works that out of you so that your light can really shine in the world. And so you, sometimes you ought to be thankful that God brings these tribulation upon you. Count it all joy. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when trials come upon you. Because God is trying to work out of you something that is more important. He's trying to prepare you to be the kind of person he wants you to be in this, in this world. Let me go here. Let me go here. Then he goes on to, we go now to, look what he says. Uh, the world, the world and its selfish desires and it causes will disappear. See, that's the, that sin is our pride and our own selfish desire. The original sin, Eve desired the apple. She looked at it, it would be something to be desired and it would make her wise. Pride 
There are uh, seven, six things that God hates. Yes, the seven is an abomination to the Lord. It's a pride look. It's a pride, do you peddling pride as something? It's something. It's something. It's, it's dangerous. I feel like it's dangerous for me. All of y'all giving me all this praise. That ain't necessarily good. That ain't necessarily good. That ain't necessarily good. I wish that y'all, some of y'all would whisper to me and tell me about some of my deficiencies. You, you don't have to do it so much because Vera may do that enough. <laughs> she, th she thinks she was ordained to do that. I won't forget one time, uh, 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 I got to get her, her name, what's, Ann. I won't forget one time, Ann, uh, you know, uh, Gordon and I, we get together and we love each other so much, we be talking, planning and scheming and thinking about everything and we going on. And, and Ann said to uh, Vera May, uh, do you have any trouble with uh, Dr. Grandpa Perkins pride and all of that, like I do with Gordy. <laughs> and, 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 and Vera may say, oh, you don't know. That's John's blind spot. He don't see that. Uh, I want, to know, want you to know, the pride is a very evasive thing. We got to watch our hearts. We got to watch our hearts. When all people speak well of you, Jesus says, watch it, watch it, watch it. Watch it, watch it. Good friends of mine, some of my greatest friends, they're the ones who uh, helped me. They're the ones who tell me. They're the ones who embrace me and say to me, John, we want you to live it out. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Be careful, be careful, be careful how you behave in the world. And that's what we need to do. Let me finish this for, for today. Thank God here. What he says here, that he, he moves from this. Look, he says, uh, but the world and its selfish desires will disappear. But if we obey God, we will live. The idea here is that we will live forever. But the idea here is that the fruit and the results of our life will be forever. You see, so he's trying to get us now to protect that. You know, Paul always talked about not losing his reward. You, you remember that? He was always talking about not losing his reward. You, you see, so pride can mess up that which we have already been doing. And one little act of pride can mess it all up. One little act of selfish desire. One little act of seeing a woman out there and start jazing and pulling you away from your faithfulness to your own wife. One little selfish desire can mess up all that you've done in the world. I watch so many wonderful pastors do so many wonderful things in the world and let one little incident pull them away and they lose all of that moral capital that they have accumulated. And God wants us to use that moral capital for his good. We have to love God with all of our heart, and with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, and with all that we have. And sin and our selfish desires will destroy all of that. Okay. Then he goes on to talk about the enemy and all of that, what he will do. Well, what I want to do then tomorrow is come back and we're going to sort of wrap it up and we wrap it up tomorrow we're going to wrap it up with what it's all about it's about us loving each other Amen. it's about us walking in love and what are you going to say tomorrow when we get there he's going to say he's going to close this book so very beautiful he's going to say keep yourself from owls and what is owls Ours is anything 
you put in the way of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for your people. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to walk, as Paul called it, circumspectly, walking very carefully in the world, walking and not allowing our pride and our selfish desire to get in our way. And when we feel it and see it, let's go to the cross. Let's go to that fountain that is filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And we then can confess our sin and he washes all our sins away. And then we can have this joy, this joy in this fellowship with each other and our fellowship with you. Because sin breaks our fellowship with you. It breaks our fellowship with each other. And then we have to walk in the light as he's in the light so we can have this fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keep on cleansing us from all sin. Thank you for this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Doctor.